There's an enormous interest in leadership these days. There are good reasons for this, and the interest has provoked some excellent guidance, counsel, and what I'm doing, as you've guessed by now, is picking up on that interest and then looking at a precondition for Christian leadership. My concern is that the interest in leadership, which is good, is accompanied by a loss of interest in followership, which is not good. For Christians, follow is the big word, not lead. Jesus said, follow me, not lead like me. But we live in a world that promotes leadership far more than followership. <clears throat> it pays leaders far better than followers, admires leaders far more than followers. Leaders influence the way we conduct our lives in many and often unconscious ways. And I think it's essential that those of us who set out to follow Jesus cultivate a discerning mind regarding the leaders that influence us and the leaders that we may become. Jesus is our leader. For Christians, at least, this is basic. No one suggests that we have an election every four years and decide whether we want him to continue as our leader. He's our leader, regardless of the polls, regardless of the economy, regardless of how we happen to feel about him at any one time, but the fact is that he has never been a very popular leader. He's much admired, much written about, at the center of much controversy, much honored and sung about, much celebrated, but he hasn't been much followed, at least not in comparison with other leaders. It turns out that following is much more difficult than leading. <clears throat> and requires a lot more attention and more moral energy. So it's not surprising that in the course of things, followership skills are neglected in preference to leadership skills. I have selected three first century leaders to set alongside Jesus to sharpen our awareness of just how totally different he is from the prevailing leadership patterns of the world and then selected three counter-movements to even further heighten the contrast. My purpose is to clarify and stimulate our believing and praying and thinking as we get out of bed each morning and set out again to follow Jesus. We looked at two major players in the lineup of the competition, Herod and Caiaphas, and now we're ready for the third, Josephus. These three leaders provide a nicely symmetrical schema against with the, which the uniqueness of Jesus can be sketched. Herod comes into view in Matthew's Gospel at the beginning of Jesus' life, near the end of his own. He survives Jesus' birth for only a year or two, Herod is bigger than life, makes his presence felt all over the country, dominates people's imaginations with his extravagant building operations. He's brutal, ruthless, rich, and effective. His last days are marked by a manic, murderous rampage. He ordered what we call the slaughter of the innocents in an attempt to kill Jesus. At the end of a lifetime of murdering anyone who got in his way or threatened his power, including several of his wives and children, he failed with Jesus. He tried, but failed to kill Jesus. Caiaphas enters the story near the end of Jesus' life, presiding over the trial of Jesus. Caiaphas presided over a religious establishment which held a prominent, comfortable position in control of an absolutely stunning place of prayer and worship, the Jerusalem Temple. The life of the Jewish people was defined by worship. Nothing was more important to the Jew than worshiping God, and the Jerusalem Temple was the focus for it. 
The annual Passover feast was the most prominent expression of that worship, and Caiaphas, the most prominent priest at that time, was at the control center of everything that went on there. Caiaphas at the center of the plot to kill Jesus. Like Herod, he was determined to kill Jesus, and unlike Herod, he succeeded. Josephus enters the Christian story seven years after the resurrection of Jesus. His name doesn't occur in the Bible, and so he's not as familiar to us, but he was tremendously active in the world in which Jesus' followers were being formed into a community, into a church. Josephus grew up in a world in which Peter was preaching and Paul was traveling all over the Mediterranean Brains starting churches. He was writing wonderful books at the same time that Paul was writing his letters and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were writing their Gospels. While the church was in formation, Josephus came into his own and demonstrated a way of leadership which was highly effective and continues to be widely practiced still. So the three men play out their leadership lives alongside and in contrast to the three pivotal events of Jesus' leadership, Herod at Jesus' birth, Caiaphas at Jesus' death, and Josephus in the era marked by Jesus' resurrection. This interests me. All three were more influential and more effective than Jesus. All three played a far larger role in the politics and religion and social conditions of the first century than Jesus did. All three achieved a prominence, a celebrity status even, in Palestine far exceeding that of Jesus. All three had far more followers in their lifetime than Jesus did. And here's the sobering thing. They still do. We're faced with this wonderful or not so wonderful irony. Jesus most admired, most worshiped, kind of, most written about, and least followed. Josephus, uh, in, our, in the popular imagination of today, is um, the least familiar of these three leaders, but he may be the one who continues to attract the most followers. The setting for considering Josephus is the years in which the community of the resurrected Jesus was in formation. Josephus was born about seven years after Jesus rose from the grave and ascended into heaven. The church was in the early years of formation. We have the story of that formation in the book of Acts and the name of Josephus doesn't appear in it. But Josephus and the Christian church grew up side by side, in the same neighborhood. Josephus and the church were contemporaries. The church had a seven-year head start on Josephus, but that's not much. He was a very religious person growing up. In his late teens, from the age of 16 to 19, he studied and more or less tried out the options before him. Tried out Pharisees, tried out Sadducees, tried out Essenes. He spent three years with a hermit named Banus. He was, seri he was serious about religion. And after all the experimenting with uh, the options, he finally opted to be a Pharisee. It's odd that there's no evidence that he didn't brush up against this exciting, joyful Christian movement. I'm expecting a report any day from the archeologists that show records that Josephus attended a vacation Bible school in Capernaum that was run by Peter's mother-in-law. <laughs> but so far, there's no evidence that he so much as noticed that the church was there. It is not a factor in his life, as far as we know. It never caught his eye. Later in his life, when he started writing books, he mentions three names that show he know, knew something of the movement, for he refers briefly to John the Baptist, Jesus, and James, the brother of Jesus, although the reference to Jesus might not be authentic. 
some scholars are not quite sure. Revolution was in the air those days, armed revolution. The Jews were getting mighty fed up with Roman rule. The country was crawling with all kinds of sects and groups that wanted to get rid of Rome by force. Roman officials, the Herod crowd, and Sadducean priests, the Caiaphas crowd, were frequent targets on a crowded street in a spaghetti of sh shoulders and elbows, a dagger could easily be slipped between your ribs and no one would know who did it. Zealot was the more or less generic name for these people, although strictly speaking, the party of the Zealots had an identity specific to them. But we commonly use the term in an inclusive sense there were variations on the theme, but the theme was always violence and freedom. Get rid of the Romans and Roman sympathizers. Jesus had at least one of them in his band of 12, Simon the Zealot, and it could be that Judas might have had ties to the Sicarii, one of the many revolutionary Zealot-like groups. The Jerusalem Talmud mentions no fewer than 24 sects who were committed to armed revolt against Rome. They had hideouts in the hills, had stashes of swords and spears and daggers. They talked and conspired, worked behind the scenes secretly, anonymously. Occasionally a leader would emerge into the open and stage a revolt against Rome, but Rome was always too much for them the revolts were quickly squashed. During Jesus' lifetime, the Zealots had a stronghold at Gamla, which was only 10 miles from Capernaum, and that was the home base of Capernaum, which was the home base for Jesus' ministry. So Jesus grew up and began his ministry in Zealot country. When Jesus went public with his ministry, it was understandable that many people would confuse him with the zealots. After all, proclaiming the overthrow of this world and the inauguration of a new kingdom, he accepted messianic epithets for himself, which the zealots used. He sure sounded like a zealot. But it didn't take long for those who followed him to realize that whatever this was, it was not zealotry. He blessed the poor in spirit. He commanded love for enemies. He approved paying taxes to Caesar. And he collected all kinds of people around him who would be of absolutely no use in a war. Women and children, the weak, the infirm. But then when Jesus rode down the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem on Passover week, it looked it really looked as if it might happen after all. All these people yelling and singing and shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. For the Roman garrison stationed at the Antonia Fortress in Jerusalem, it probably didn't seem much of a threat. They were stationed there to prevent uprisings and threats to the government. But this didn't seem like it would be it. A lot of women and children, palm branches instead of swords, an atmosphere of frolic. That doesn't mean the Romans weren't ready. They were used to dealing with zealots, and Passover week was a popular stage for riots. During Jesus' lifetime, they had put down outbreaks much worse than this and had crucified hundreds, hundreds of zealots. They were ready but I can't believe they were much worried. The final and convincing proof that Jesus was not a zealot was that after his crucifixion, there was no revolt, no violence, no looting, no killing, nothing. Meanwhile, in this world in which the zealots were getting more and more intense, Josephus was making his way in the world. He was bright, he was talented, 
After his self-schooling in various streams of Judaism in his late teens and early 20s, he was picked by the Jewish leadership for a diplomatic mission to Rome, the center of world action. At the age of 27, he was sent to negotiate the release of some Jewish priests who were in prison there. He's pretty young on a diplomatic mission like that, and he succeeded. One of the elements of his success was that he was able to make friends with and enlist the help of Nero's mistress, Papea Sabina. How he got to her, we don't know, but he found his way into the court life. This was 64 AD. During the time Josephus was in Rome negotiating the release of Jewish priests, cultivating the influence of Papea Sabina and others, St. Paul was in prison in the same city, a prisoner of Nero who was soon to kill him. These dates are not exact, so um, these might have been not exact conjunctions. But it's fascinating to think that these two things were going on at the same time. Two very famous and very different leaders. Josephus, the rising star in Judaism, and Paul, the vigorous missionary in the newly forming Christian church. But Josephus, on familiar terms with Nero's court and getting Jewish priests out of prison, while Paul is in prison, and soon to be killed, or maybe already just killed. And then Josephus, his diplomatic mission successfully completed, is back in Palestine, and Paul was dead. His missionary travels over. Things are heating up now in Palestine. Increasing outbreaks of violence against Rome, and Rome responding with a major offensive. And then Josephus, young as he was, he's only 29 years old now, fresh from this diplomatic venture in Rome, was appointed as the general in Galilee, the front line of defense for Palestine as the Roman forces came out of the north and Syria on their way to destroy Jerusalem. 